A leader has to take the risks. What's going on, dude? How are you? I'm doing really good. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to be here with you today. And uh, so the Deal Machine Real Estate Investor Podcast, man. So what, what got you inspired to start a podcast, man? Yeah, we spend half a million dollars a year sponsoring the Bigger Pockets podcast. So if we could start our own, I thought that'd be a good way for people to learn about our app. Okay. And so, uh, so, so you, you have an app then. So tell me about your app. What, what is that about? Yeah, it's called Deal Machine. And okay. uh, it's been around seven years. And I started it because I was looking for a rental property. And I was told to look for a rundown house and write down the address, look up who owns it, send a letter that says, would you like an offer on your house? And somebody will respond who ends up wanting speed and convenience over a good price. And so um, I made an app that does that process. So that's how Deal Machine started. So, uh, so what's, I mean, what's that like? building an app? I mean, is that hard to do? I mean, how much time did it take to, to build it out? Did you have somebody help you do it? What, what was that process? Well, I built the first version in a weekend for me. It wasn't meant, I wasn't trying to build like a business, but I just needed like a, a map that I could pin it and would look up the owner from the county and then send mail through another company. So I built that in a weekend uh, myself. And then when uh, somebody else like, wanted to use it, I did put it on the app store. And uh, once it was on the app store, people started to find it um, when they search for driving for dollars. That's like the, the type of marketing that, that that is when you look for a rundown house. Um, and then I realized like pe it needed to look better, but that wasn't really my skill set. So um, my best friend, I, I'd done a lot of projects with, and he's an even better developer than me. So made him 50% partner. And we formed Deal Machine in May of 2017. So we it's not ever done. You know, we update uh, every two weeks. Um, have definitely, you know, innovated this year as well. So um, it's it's it, it could be a little tougher if you don't know how to like code. But from uh, my perspective, I had like a base, you know, knowledge because I studied engineering. Okay, so tell me about that. Like, wh what were you like as a kid, man? I mean... You, you were always interested in engineering and things like that? Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely didn't grow up uh, around any real estate or entrepreneurs, um, but I, I was always uh, definitely kind of into building stuff. Like I had an older sister and I would set this prank so that like if she opened her like sock drawer, you know, it would like play a buzzer sound, you know, and I like constructed that with a battery and a speaker and like wire and tape. And then I also had the chore of like cutting the grass and uh, it, instead of sweeping it, I had this RC car and I had a remote control airplane. So I like built a little trailer for the RC car and used the airplane propeller to like blow the grass off. So my mom saw that and she was like, you know, you can do that. It's called engineering. So I was like, oh man, that's what I want to do from sixth grade. I knew I wanted to be an engineer. However, was pretty excited by the business opportunity uh, after reading the four hour work week and hearing how Tim Ferriss set up a life where he didn't necessarily retire by 40, you know, like I previously wanted to, but he was able to set up a life like right away, you know, where he wasn't tying his income to the time he was spending. So that was very inspirational. I didn't know how to do it, but that was something that was planted in my head in high school and kind of got me interested in business. Yeah, you you uh, you seem like you've always been. Well, you have this engineering background, but you also are highly money motivated. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, it's um, it's a pleasure uh, in my position now. Like we we've helped people close ten thousand deals in all fifty states. Seven years in, a huge driver for a lot of people is spending more time with their family. And uh, I was just interviewing uh, a guy. Um, named Wes, he's like, well, I was working 60 hours a week, but then I had, you know, a kid and I wanted to find something that I was a little bit more flexible. So I found out the secret is you don't actually want to retire. Nobody wants to stop working. They just want more meaningful work and a little bit more control. So I will say for me though, I do not have kids and 
I, I it had a dream car and I love the, the, the time freedom, but also um, you could say that I was money motivated for the things that I think money can buy that I get excited about like that. And so it, it was always for, for you, you wanted, you wanted to have the toy. I mean, do you think you'll ever have kids? I mean, do you want a family and, and I don't all think that? I need kids, but maybe okay. one day. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'd rather just focus on like one of the greatest joys of like growing a business is the, the personal development that it requires you to have in order to grow the business more. So like this year, I mean, all I wanted to do was get better at grow, my, my podcast itself was like the biggest, you know, personal thing and uh, social media as well. Like I had made $50 million in revenue in my business um, over seven years before I, and that was all from social media, but I didn't like realize, oh, that's because social media, that's because people that make YouTube videos and help people get financial freedom through real estate investing recommend Deal Machine, this app that I created. So super thankful that it was uh, something that, that people naturally started recommending, but it wasn't until this year that I realized if my business wants to go to the next level, we should do marketing on our own. I should learn the skill of marketing. So I, I made a challenge to post you know, four times per day and I'll hit a thousand posts by the end of the year. I'm at 948 now. So I've gotten better and I still have a lot to learn, but I think that's like one of the greatest like joys of business after you know I had become financially free and gotten some time freedom as well, probably by the age of 29. And so what what is what is that freedom? How, how you know how would you describe that freedom and like how did you get there? I mean, was there a certain number that you had? What was that number for you that said, okay, I got this number, I'm earning this kind of cash flow, I'm free. What, what, what was that number for you? And what does that look like? Yeah. So when I started out, I was working a $50,000 a year job. And I quit that when I was 26. Now from 21 to 26, I saved 50% of my salary. So I was already living a pretty frugal life. I had three roommates, I drove a rusty Honda Accord. And uh, I didn't make the 50% every month because, man, it's just really tight to live on 50 grand. But for the most part, I was successful in doing that. Um, when I, when I had this idea for deal machine, um, and I knew it could be a business beyond just getting my own rental property, I was able to use that savings instead of investing it, just burning it while I worked on deal machine for a couple of years before it paid me. So, um, yeah, so I, I kind of forgot what the actual question is you just asked me, but well, I did, I just want to get, and, and I'll tell you why I asked the question is because I actually started, uh, I built a financial services company. I started at 21. I was making seven bucks an hour when I started. And by the time I was 28, I had saved my first million dollars in cash. So oh, wow. that, that for me was, um, you know, and, and, and I was actually earning um, mm. just right around $500,000 a year in gotcha. passive income. And so it was, it, for me, it was like, that meant freedom That's to me. Amazing. Like I, yeah. I, I, I wanted to, because I always thought, right. If, 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 you know, if everything went away, that million bucks at 10%, that generated a hundred grand a year. That's enough you know, to that's, live on. That's, exactly. that's enough to live on and be okay. So th what, what was the so, number for you? Yeah. It was like 14 rental properties, you know, there you it go. was like, there I was making 70,000 a year. I was like, let me, let me find a way to get to those rental properties. So I knew I had to find discounted properties. Um, I, I couldn't really fathom saving a million dollars in cash for some reason, but I had done like my first rental property and uh, used a strategy called the Burr strategy where you get a good enough deal, you can get it financed and get all your money back out and just go do it again. So I could see a path that way, you know, um, and that was kind of what I was focused on. Yeah. I mean, it's, ca it's cash flow, man. I mean, you just, you, you went the cash flow way and I just, the, the reason why I had been so focused on saving money is because and investing the the cash is because uh i i of course dealt mostly with the stock market versus real estate so mm -hmm. most most of my portfolio ended up being in 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 stocks and investments like that and uh de decent little, little bit of of real estate but um but yeah i i think that uh, and and i love hearing your story because it's very similar to mine in the sense that I was saving 50% of my, you know, long, long time. I mean, that, that entire time I was investing in the right spots, getting 
great rates of return on my investment. And, but I was driving around in a $10,000 maximum. I was making $300,000 a year and I was driving around a little, you know, beater car. And I, I look back and everybody told me, go buy a nicer car. You, you know, you're supposed to sell the dream and you got to buy this and buy a bigger house. And they were telling me all these things to do. And then I, and of course I didn't listen to them. I just stuck, stuck with my strategy and stuck with my game plan. I knew exactly what I wanted to achieve by the time I was, you know, before I, I wanted to get it all done before 30 happened a little bit earlier than that, but that was my absolute focus was to get there at 30. Didn't want to retire because retirement means dying. So I didn't want to die. So I kept working, of course, but I was able right. to scale it down big time and then do, like you said, right. Do the things that are more fun, do the things that you want to do more of and not have to worry so much about money all the time. And that was, that's what freedom was to me. So uh, now, did you, you know, always when, live on the beach whenever you were making, uh, <laughs> driving that Nissan. I actually didn't. I, matter of fact, I never lived at the beach until now. I live in Newport Beach now, but uh, my entire career, I lived in the inland in California. So, I mean, I was only an hour from the beach, but, uh, you know, I, I lived kind of near more mountains. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it was just wealth on the beach really was kind of a metaphor for me that gave people a visual of what freedom choices and options were. I mean, because that that's all I was ever fighting for was freedom, choices, and options. I, I didn't yeah. want anybody to put their thumb on me. I wanted to be in control 100%. I wanted to in control of my life. If I want to travel, I travel. If I want to take the whole day off and watch Netflix all day, I can do that too. So I can do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, anytime I want to do it. And that was my absolute focus. Now, of course, I kept working. I, of course, I love to do my podcasts and write books. And I, I, there's other things I love to do. And, and, you know, I have a couple of kids and I love to spend time with my kids. But the truth is, man, I, it was always about the freedom. So that's where Wealth on the Beach came from. Love it. So, um, so tell me, like, I, I mean, was there, did you have like mentors? Did you have people that inspired you early on that, really kind of, you know, maybe there was somebody in real estate that was like a, an idol of yours a little bit, or like a, a you know, somebody that, that kind of inspired you to get to that next level. Yeah. So I worked at a small company and the owner had five rental properties and I asked him why he has those instead of the stock market. And he said that you could retire. He wanted to retire when he was 40 and those rental properties would give cash flow every month, unlike the stock market that goes up and down. So that's what got me onto the idea. Then I went and looked for you know, a real estate meetup. And I was told to go look for houses that look run down. And the meetup was run by somebody named Brittany Wicks, who came to Indianapolis once a month to buy 30 properties. And once she saw that I made this app, and I was using it for myself, she's like, well, I'll spend a thousand dollars to try any new marketing. And my jaw dropped. I was like, I'm not trying to, I'm not even trying to sell this. Like if this was this easy to sell, I should put this on the app store. So, um, you know, I had to come up with a name. And so that's, that, that's kind of history there. I didn't really have any mentors in real estate besides that boss that I worked for. And my own curiosity just kind of led me to people that were doing things, which was very important because my parents were totally worried. They're like, David, we're worried. You know, everybody we've talked to has had this horrible story. You know, Diane at our church inherited a property and the tenant trashed the house and left and she didn't have insurance. So she didn't have a choice of, you know, renting this property again. We just don't want to see you get hurt. And being around people that were doing it was so important because I do love my parents. They meant well, but I had known it was possible because I could see people doing it. Yeah, that's funny that you say that because uh, I always tell people, man, you know, don't take advice from people that don't really understand what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, a lot of people tell you a lot of different things, you know, this won't work, this won't work, can't do it this way, you should do it this way. And you can always just just say, hey, thank you so much for your advice. I appreciate it. But then just do the exact opposite. Um, never take advice from anybody more messed up than you. And, uh, you know, not that your parents are more messed up than you, but you get what I'm saying. I mean, you know, like everybody's got an opinion, everybody wants to talk about what they know. But in Unless they know, no, unless they've been through it, 
they uh, and, and look, and when you're trying a new venture, uh, like what you were trying to accomplish and what you were trying to build and, and what you built and, uh, you know, nobody knows if it's going to work until you try it, right? Nobody's going to know whether it's going to be good or bad until you actually go do it. And you did it. And thank God you didn't listen to, to other people. And, uh, you know, what yes. we're, you know, so you have anything to say about that? Like any comment? Well, on that? once my income from it increased, I had a lot of fun asking my dad if he wanted to go to a Star Trek convention in Las Vegas, which I knew he was a huge fan of. And I paid for the whole trip, the whole hotel, the whole admission. And on my mom's side, she had only been to three concerts in her whole life. And she loves the Beatles. So I took her to a Paul McCartney concert, again, paid for the transportation and the hotel and the concert. And that was the first time I ever did anything like that. And that was so cool because it came from what they were telling me they were afraid of. Now, I didn't say anything directly, but I, I in myself, I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, man. It's it's so cool when, like, and I think, I think that a part of our nature, and I have a feeling that me and you probably are similar in a lot of ways, and but I think in our nature, there is a piece of us that wants to prove people wrong. It's like, tell me what I can't do yeah. If I believe I can do it. Yeah, exactly. Like, tell me I can't do it. And I want to do it like 10 times more now because you told me I couldn't do it. I really want to do it now. And I want to prove, I mean, that's, that's, I think that's why I did okay in the beginning was because I, uh, I had a best friend that, you know, he told me that my business was a scam and, you know, it'll never work and I should stay in college and, you know, just, you know, keep, you know, doing the regular nine to five thing. And, and I, I just, there was just something inside of me. I said, no, man. I said, I think this thing's going to work. I, I, I can see how people will all, always need financial services. They'll always need investments. They'll always need insurance. They'll always need all this stuff. And I said, I believe this thing is going to work. And, and, uh, and the model, I believed in the model. I believed in the system. I believed in the process, all this stuff. And I said, I, you know what? I, I don't think that you're right. And I mm -hmm. think I'm going to, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it my best. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? You know, you never know what's going to happen, but, but right. once he told me all these bad things about what I was trying to accomplish and he was really negative, uh, I just wanted to do it even more. And I think even today, to this day, I talk about, I, in my book, I actually talk about this guy in my book and I said, thank God for this guy. I mean, he changed my life. If he wasn't such a dick, right? I I, yeah. I don't think I would have ever done what I did. He's the he's a huge bit of the the fuel that it took because he made to be me able want to, to do it. He made me want to do it because I was going to prove him wrong. He was such a jerk, and I wanted to prove him wrong. And that's what I did. I fought every day. I worked every day. I did what I said I was going to do every day to prove this guy wrong. And of course, yeah. I don't have any relationship well, with this guy anymore, but. You know? uh, well, he didn't do the business and he wasn't your ideal customer no. either, but here's he three, here's yeah. three scams that I thought were scams that definitely aren't. Um, when I first graduated college, people were hitting me up for life insurance and I was like, I don't have any kids and I can get a better return. Fast forward. Now that I've started a business, I actually bought a life insurance policy on my business partner. So that way, and he bought a policy on me that way, if one of us, you know, has an accident, passes away then that policy can buy the shares from the other person and the business can move forward seamlessly. But without life insurance, that wouldn't be possible. Another thing is these um, th the way that a lot of my customers end up buying real estate deals is they buy them for a low price. So again, if you don't understand who would want that, it sounds like a scam, but then you're like, Oh no, sometimes people just want to get rid of stuff. Just like at a pawn shop, you bring a guitar, you know, you're not getting the top dollar, but you just want to get rid of it and get the cash for it. So it's just like, you can't take advice from people who aren't really in it or that, that ideal customer, because it's very hard to understand people have different wants and needs than you do. All right. Uh, artificial intelligence. How is this playing a role in your you know, next chapter of, of your career and in, in your business? Yeah. Well, um, as a new real estate investor, I get stuck with analysis paralysis. And even five years into my real estate investing journey, when I already had 10 rentals, I was moving to, I moved to Austin, Texas, and I was 
not sure if I should buy more rentals in Austin or in Indianapolis, but I knew I needed to buy more rentals because not only did they cash flow $70,000 a year net after the mortgage taxes and insurance, but they had appreciated almost a million dollars. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. <laughs> and I was like, I should have had more rentals. So I want to buy some more again, but I couldn't decide should I buy them in Austin or in Indianapolis. So it's a problem that happens with everybody. But uh, ChatGPT came out and it can help you make decisions, but it doesn't know about real estate data. So we plugged in ChatGPT to the deal machine app. So you can ask it, analyze this wholesale deal, analyze this as a flip. What should I say to the seller? This is where the conversation is stuck. And it can give you advice based on the real estate data that we can provide it in deal machine. So it's like a huge way the AI has started helping our customers is overcoming that analysis paralysis when you just really need a third party validation of the offer you're about to make. And the AI can help you with that. That's, that's, uh, that's gold, dude. I mean, that's big. It's a big deal, man. It's been uh, cool. Yeah. I mean, it just, well it just makes, it just makes sense, you know? And now I don't know if uh, now chat, I don't know if you knew this, but now chat GBT is connected to the internet now. So it's yeah. real time data. So uh, I, I use it all the time. I mean, it, it is invaluable to my life. Uh, but I, um, cause I, I, I mean, even, even so much. So uh, I have some commercial property that I own and, and I, um, I'm having a new renter come in and it, it analyzed, you know, things on the lease contract that I didn't understand. So it's, you know, 11 o'clock at night, I'm not going to call the lawyer. So I'm just analyzing it by myself. All right. What does this word mean? What is this, you know, sentence? Is this sentence in my favor or is it in their favor? Like, what does this actually mean? And it, it is wild. It's, it's like a lawyer. It's a right. lawyer. It's past the bar. You know, yeah, yeah, it's past, it's past the, bar, the bar. Yeah, it, it, it's it's wild to me. I mean, just all the different recommendations. I mean, I, I it's, a lot of people don't know this, but you could take the uh, the contents in your refrigerator. If you just you know say you're you know you're sitting there and you're like I don't know what to eat, and you take all the contents in your refrigerator, you just type them in there, and you're like, give me recipes to make stuff right. I can make from, from the stuff I have in my refrigerator. Right. It's awesome. It really is awesome. It sure is. I use it as well for making my podcast descriptions. It can listen to the whole episode and suggest timestamps of when important things happen. And it saves a lot of time. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, this, this morning, just so you know, I mean, when, when I was putting together, I mean, I watched a lot of your videos and I was watching a lot of your, your Instagrams and everything. But then I, I took some, some pertinent information about you and then I threw it into chat GBT and I'm like, give me some ideas of some cool questions that I can ask him. And so, uh, and, and it just popped out, you know, 10 questions yeah. to, to give me some, you know, direction. And it, it, it's really cool because like in this day and age, there's so many things you got to do, especially as, a, as an entrepreneur. Right. I tell people all the time because I think people look at it. Some people that that maybe are not business owners or they don't understand how technology is good. And I explain to people that uh, you know you're not cheating. You know when you go in and you ask ChatGPT to tell you information, you're not cheating. Okay, so just let's get this clear. You haven't. You have now an assistant. You know, wealthy people for the, the for all of time have had what? Assistance, but they have to mm -hmm. pay assistance lots and lots of money. So they got to pay. Like if you have a, a real good assistant, it's going to cost you $50,000, $100,000 a year to have a really good assistant. You know, that's going to every, you know, I need this. I need that. I need that answer. Can you print that up for me? Can you type that for me? Can you do this for me? And now for 20 bucks on chat GBT, you know, whatever the fourth version or whatever. Now I have an assistant 24 hours a day doesn't get sick, doesn't call in sick, doesn't, doesn't complain, doesn't get upset at me for anything. And for 20 bucks a month, now I have a complete assistant that helps me with so much that nobody ever helped me with before. And yeah, uh, it, it's, it, awesome. it's that's, that's how powerful. Am I right? I mean, yeah, it's getting better too. Rapid. Yeah. It's crazy good. It's crazy good. And so, so when, when you think about like, uh, you know, what other things, are there any other things that you use, how, how you use chat at all? 
that's how I use the a the the chats. Yeah, for me. Okay. So that that's the main. Th those are the main ways that it assists you. It assists you in your app, and then it also helps you kind of with your podcast podcast uh, descriptions and things like that. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Cool. And uh, where do you see this technology in the future? I mean, do you see it, you know, re replacing jobs, and do you see it as a as a, as a total positive thing, or do you see maybe some of it as being negative? No, it's it's all positive. I'm an optimist for sure. And specifically in the real estate space, you know, one of the things that all of our members, app subscribers are doing is they're trying to find great real estate deals that are off market. They're typically sending mail and getting calls back. But I get a lot of spam calls on my phone. So I'm not sure which one is from a call from my mail or from my um, from a spam caller. So what I do is I hire a call center that takes the calls, they take notes, and then they tell me when it's time to do that. Now, if you're just getting started out, we're going to have uh, a phone that can replicate your voice and kind of qualify and answer those calls for you. It's going to sound just like you, but it's not going to be you. It's going to be the AI. So that can actually answer your call, ask the right question to the seller, sound like you, and let you know how to and when to take over the conversation if it's a qualified lead. My friend Tiana Lawrence just published a book. Uh, she's a venture capitalist. And she uploaded a 60 second clip of her voice and AI was able to read her entire book. It sounded just like her, man. It's wild. It can do a lot of things. So I think in my, you know, deal machine hat, that's where it's going. It's going to help answer those calls. So you don't even miss out on deals because you're at the gym uh, or you're sleeping. I mean, it's going to be uh, a truly amazing advancement, I think, for the space. It's almost like cloning is happening. I mean, we're really kind of getting to this point where, you know, cloning your voice. I mean, matter of fact, it's it's interesting that you told me that because just this morning I do a, uh, I have a coaching program called Wealth on the Beach Club. And uh, every Wednesday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, we get a bunch of people on and, and we uh, talk about all kinds of things, you know, when it comes to sales and marketing and building brand and, uh, you know, uh, building processes in the company and all that, you know, a lot of business owners are on there. And one of the guys, he actually got on and he showed me uh, that, you know, you just type into this app. I, I forget what the app was, but, you know, he types in this app and it and it's his voice. And so he was actually literally just this morning showing right, me. Same thing. That same thing. And you just type in whatever you want it to say, and it's saying it in your voice. What app What app are you using? What app are you talking about? Well, I'm not sure which app Tiana used, mm -hmm. but I was speaking of a feature that Deal Machine would have in the future that would answer our customers' phones for them. Okay, gotcha. And But but is that is that available right now? Like, could you set that up right now? Is that possible? No. Or that's just no. what you, you foresee that in yeah, the future? Yeah, I foresee that. Correct. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, you know, it's, it's coming, dude. It's coming, man. For, for sure. sure. It's coming. All right. The free house story. Tell me about that, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, a free house is pretty easy to come by if you find a good enough deal, but I got to break it down because uh, somebody's going to be like, what are you talking about? So the first free house that I ever got was some house I saw with the gutter falling off and I sent you know, a postcard to them and put it on repeat once a month. And it, the postcard just said, I'm interested in purchasing your house. If you're interested, call or text me. I can close quickly with cash. Seven months later, I got a call from a man and he said he'd like an offer. It was his parents' house and his last parent passed away. So I came in there and they were a hoarder. Yellow, the walls were weirdly yellow and, um, I saw it was like probably worth 160 in perfect condition. I offered like 55 because I knew I was redoing everything in this house. Before I closed, um, I was going to get a contractor in there to validate my estimate for the repairs. And he pointed out that the, the walls are yellow because they were heavy smokers. And if you moved a painting, you were going to see like a huge demarcation line. And I almost lost my stomach, but... Then he's like, you know, you probably need 10 extra thousand dollars to professionally seal this or to replace the drywall and do it right. So I came back to the sun and I was like, this is where I'm at. I don't know how to say this because I know you're trying to close out. He had debts on his parents' estate that he needed to close out. Um, he ended up doing the deal. 
Um, I didn't have a ton of money. I, I found that there was a company called SoFi, S-O-F-I, that would do $100,000 loan unsecured as long as you had a decent credit score and a W-2 job. So I got $100,000, bought this house, fixed it up. And by the time I got the mortgage and it appraised for 160, but I only had 120 in it. So I got, you know, 120 back and 25% equity, like I made a down payment, but I didn't, I got the house back. And then I put a tenant in there who's paid the mortgage payment that I've had then some every single month. So it's, it's got a 30 year note, but it's also appreciated at like 225. Now it's cash flow every month. The mortgage has been handled by the, um, the tenant and that 120, I came to pay back SoFi. And so paid that, that loan off. So that's what I would call a free house. Yeah. Sounds like it to me, man. Are you ever, uh, I mean, are, are you thinking about, uh, I mean, do you ever, do you ever do like multifamily or big apartment buildings or anything? I mean, is that, are you, are you just really, you know, single family, uh, most of the time? Yeah. I just, I've only done single family and okay. those are pretty cool. Um, I, I haven't done it. It would be a new thing for me to learn, but I've really made the decision to stick with what I know for now, at least, and at least get me to 20 houses. Cause I think focus every time I have focused, it's been better than getting shiny object syndrome and seeing them throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. So I just kind of want to exploit the knowledge and experience that I have by just doing more of what I know right now. So what are some strategies that you have for uncovering those badass deals that you get? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, I just um, made a list uh, the other day of 25 motivated seller lists and which ones you should approach them in what order. Um, and it, it's episode 78 on the Deal Machine podcast. It's important for me to order them because it's hard to pick if you don't, have any direction. And the first one is how I describe the, the driving for dollars. The reason why that's so great is it is free. It forces you to learn your neighborhood by driving around and seeing homes. And it's low cost to market to that list because big time investors will not put in the time to make that list. Uh, big time investors will blanket all the absentee owners. And so um, they're not marketing to these distressed homes because they have to put that down. So it's less marketing you have to send in order to get a deal and you can buy it deeper because there's less investors reaching that person. So great way to start. Um, and as you start to scale, like the next one would be go to your county and pick the tax delinquent list that you can download mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and send them mail. Um, I just had recently done that 1700 properties in Indianapolis that didn't pay their taxes in the month of August. And I got a call. I was on the treadmill at the time. I was like, oh, I'll call it later. But then I was like, no, that feels like procrastination. I'm just going to answer it on the treadmill. The guy was just like, hey, I bought these properties two years ago. The guy who was advising me never did the rehab. And so they've just been sitting there. And I'm making too much money at my medical practice to spend the time pulling my hair out more on these properties. So he bought, he bought this one for 200. He owed 180. I couldn't buy it for more than 160 and he, he sold it to me. He brought, he brought 20 K to the table to, to, to close it for me. So uh, those are definitely two ways. And, and if you guys want more, I would check out that episode 78, 25 motivated seller leads of the, the deal machine pod. So how, how much time did you spend? Because it sounds to me like you did a lot of self-improvement. You know, tell me about some of your favorite books. Tell me about some of your favorite motivational people that have inspired you through the years. Because you you have definitely worked on yourself, yeah. And you 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 have spent time, also. I would imagine. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you've spent time learning how to sell because you're a closer. I mean, you know, you get somebody <laughs> to, to you know they they want to sell it to you for this, and you That's end funny. up coming in and get you know so. You're a closer, man. man. You, 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 you do that. So tell me about that. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> I personally don't believe I have a lot of sales skills, but what I've realized is that sales, in my experience, is a process of disqualification. And I gave that conversation to that guy on the treadmill. And I said, just collected some info, asked what's going on. 
and just gave him the honest truth. And I didn't, I didn't, you know what I mean? Like I actually just realized these great deals come from people who are truly motivated and it's like a walk in the park. You know, all I have to do, I'm more analytical is just be sure about what I can actually offer it and then be unemotional if that doesn't work for them, you know? So that's actually been my strategy. Although I appreciate the compliment very much um, in terms of books. These are all the books I read last year. So there's 15 books. And I, I started off with 75 hard, which is a mental toughness challenge that includes reading 10 pages of a book every day to make reading a habit. Um, and then a couple others on here that I really liked were um, the one page marketing plan, David Goggins can't hurt me. And my very favorite, I did read the ultimate sales machine. A lot of these were so good, but my very favorite was humor. Seriously. Um, I wasn't always, you know, having so much fun in my business. There, there was a time where we grew, grew a lot, and then we kind of stopped growing and that gave me anxiety. The way I got out of it was physical fitness with the 75 hard and humor seriously helped me lighten up at work which made my employees way more comfortable and less stressed because stress helps nobody uh, get out of like a hole or a tough situation. And so um, that would be just some tidbits on what I've done to work on myself. And this year, I'm actually hired a podcast coach to just help me communicate better with my mission of building my Instagram following and uh, um, yeah, communicating how to quit your job and 10x your income through wholesaling real estate on the podcast. Very cool. Very cool. And your next book, by the way, will be called Wealth, Wealth on, on the, the beach. beach. Okay. So Amazon, if, uh, if, if the audience has not read this book, go out and get this book. Um, I, I really believe, I mean, we, we hit on everything. It's 11 universal laws to building financial freedom, but we really hit on every aspect of somebody that's become successful at some point. I mean, we, we, we even talk about law of attraction. We, we talk about frequencies. We talk about health. We talk about sales. We talk about building teams. We talk about processes. We talk about systems. We talk about all types of different types of passive income, including by the way, which, which I, 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 Earlier, you had said that in the stock market, you you know the it goes up and down, but you're not really earning cash from it. Well, if you if you learn options, by the way, option contracts will pay you rent on your stocks. So that's one way that I bring in a lot of cash flow every single month is through uh, uh, through just um, setting up a, a you know like a put or a call an option contract and. Uh, and they pay me what's called a premium. They pay me premiums every single uh, week or, you know, whatever, however long I set up the expiration. And so just an idea. That's awesome. Um, and, and, and so so tell me about uh, the as far as, you know, obviously you, you, you talked about something, Ryan Haywood's story and how you are replicating right now and, and how you're really trying to replicate that system. Tell me about that. Right. Yeah. So. In 2019, we had this guy come along and download the app, and he was making, uh, he was making pretty good money selling telecom services. But his boss like changed his pay structure, so he took a 14 day challenge, quit that job, and he made like 8,500 dollars from finding a rundown house and then passing it off to an investor. It's called wholesaling real estate. So the thing that was crazy was um, he made more finding those rundown houses um, than he was like doing the telecom work and he got more time back. And so he's now my co-host of my podcast, you know, to provide that expertise on like deals that he's doing now. He's done 419 deals uh, since then. So he's just been a, a tremendous story that I wanted to highlight when you're thinking about trying to get out of your job, but you don't know anybody who has, you know, so he would be somebody I would definitely recommend checking out. Um, they're like heritage home investments on Instagram. And of course he's the, the co-host of the deal machine pod. And how did you guys meet? How did that relationship start? Well, he downloaded the app. I didn't know him then. That was it. So it was yeah. from the app then. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. He, you know, he downloaded the app. He was using it to identify and reach out to homeowners. And whenever he, you know, had done a deal, there's a little trigger. And when he marked the deal as closed, 
that I invite him to come do a, a call with me, you know, and then we kind of go over that success story and help him out, you know, help people out who are trying to get their first deal and help figure out where he should go next. So that's how we met. And what do you like, do you get involved in politics at all? I mean, what are you, you know, uh, how is politics playing a role at all? If, if any role at all in your life and uh, in, in the, you know, real estate market at all. Yeah. So I have not voted in several of the past elections because I lived in a city or a state where I didn't feel like that was going to make a difference. And I'd rather spend my time focusing on what I can control, which is me. So I found that to be a little bit different than my friends, you know, in their early twenties thought it's funny. Now my friends kind of flip flopped uh, from more left to right as they've gotten older, weird uh, that that tends to happen. But um, well, why does that tend to happen? I don't know, man. It just says, well, I, I know I'm just, well, I, I know, but I, I just wanted to see if you, if you knew, but uh, it's because when, when people start making money, let's be honest. I mean, you start making money, you want the government to take less and less. And for some reason, the left, they want to take more and more. And so I don't know. Do you, do you see that? So in your, in your state? Yeah. I, either, neither party is like, uh, you have to have all these like black and white, you know, issues to identify as Republican or a Democrat. And right. I just don't agree with all the policies of either party. You know, okay. I, I think that abortions should be legal, Okay, but I'm probably more right leaning than left. So I don't know um, why they changed their minds, probably because they, yeah, they were, they were making more money and they want to pay less taxes. But I think the parties have like changed a lot too in that time period and gotten like just so black and white, you know, that they, it really, everybody's kind of more in the middle than in either one of those parties. I, I think you're right. I, I think also that, uh, you know, as, as time goes on, I think that the, the, the left is becoming more radicalized and the right is becoming, you know, well, I mean, there's a lot of radical right as well, but I think it's just the parties have almost switched, you know, like the, like free speech and things like that. I mean, the left used to be always about free speech, you know, give people a voice and things like that. And now, you know, they want to censor people. They want to, I mean, did, did, did COVID, did you get affected by COVID at all? I mean, did you have any challenges through those, uh, through in 2020 at all? Thankfully, no outside factor has ever come into play for my business, to be honest, no matter what the interest rates were, no matter what COVID was, everybody has always wanted to find financial freedom. And also the way our members are helping people, you know, unload these unwanted properties, those situations happen all the time too. Somebody's not paying their mortgage. There's a death in the family. The house is in bad shape. That stuff always happens. So my business up and downs have only been because we were or were not doing something in a good way. Like so in terms of our skill of operating and marketing our business, what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, you're, but, but you're, you're in that, uh, in that place though, I think also with your mindset, because in any business, the, the mindset is everything. I mean, you know, there, there's, there's the victim mentality where, you know, this is bad and, you know, uh, I can't control this and the president's bad. So I'm not going to make money this year or, you know, this is, and so your mindset is just different where you're thinking in terms of, okay, what can I can, you know, what can I control and what am I going to do about my life? What am I going to, I'm going to get up every single day and run my game. I'm going to run my process and whether interest rates are good or interest rates are bad, I'm going to find a way to make a deal. You know, right. I'm, I'm going to build an app. I'm going to, I'm going to create a community. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get up every day, try to add value to other people so that they, that way they want to keep coming back. It feels better to take control rather than to blame out external factors as well. So it's a, it's another part of it for me. But I, I unfortunately have to go uh, meet with a customer soon. How can we wrap up other than me buying your book, Wealth on the Beach, and also learning the 11 pillars to get financial freedom? Yeah, we're going to wrap up by you telling us how to, to reach out and connect with you. Like, how do people get to know Thank you so much uh, David, for you know? the opportunity. Yeah, you're a great host. And uh, D, D Leco is my Instagram would be the best place to reach out. So I post four videos per day 
on achieving financial freedom and real estate tips and what I'm doing with my personal goals of getting into race car driving. So if any of that's interesting, check it out. Yeah, no, we, we really appreciate, I mean, you got a great mind on your, uh, uh, you know, you got a great mind, you got a great focus. I mean, you are no question about it going in the right direction and, and doing big things. And so uh, we, uh, we're going to root you on every step of the way and we wish you the absolute best. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate your advice today. Uh, there's no question about it. The world needs more people just like you. If anybody that's watching on YouTube or iTunes, Spotify, uh, or wherever you're finding this content, uh, you know, if you if you could reach out to David and say thank you, uh, go follow him on Instagram, uh, go check out his content, but just leave him a DM and just say, hey, thank you so much for coming on Welcome cool. on the Beach podcast. Yeah, I mean, just connect with him. I mean, he's a cool guy and, uh, you know, I'm sure that he'll answer back and and uh, who knows, maybe maybe you might be inspired by him in some way or get his app. And, uh, and if you're interested in, you know, trying to find some, some good deals, then there's no question it, it works. What he's doing works and it is possible for you to achieve financial freedom as well. So now you just got to take that next step and, and do what needs to be done. So with that said, everybody have a great day. Uh, just continue to dream bigger than ever. You got to get after it, man. You have to get after it, but most importantly, do it now. God bless. We'll see you at the top.